All right, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Woo. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas to you. I was thinking winter wasn't coming this year. Yeah, it looks like it is. At least for a month or so. Not too bad. Glad you're here today. I've got to hurry. Wrap this up. I have ballet today. Thought I would never say that, but I did, Robert. I don't know. I got football later, but ballet first. Your pastor is a cultured man. <laughs> Neck deep today, this week. So that's okay. It's going to be fun. Can't wait for that. Heaven and nature sing. Uh, we're talking about some of the cantors or songs of the Christmas time that we have during the church. And so today I'm going to talk to you about Mary's song of worship. Okay. Uh, that's found in the scripture in Luke chapter 1. Um, it starts out with, uh, My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And it ends that the grace of God is extended from generation to generation. It's a great song. That Mary sings as she has this news of this child Messiah in her wound, uh, and that she's going to be the mother of Jesus, conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so she sings this song that historically in the church is known as the Magnificat, we would call it. Uh, a little too formal for me. I, I, I like more like Mary's song. She just sang it uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it means, it, it, Magnificat means the prayer of Mary. It's the song. It's the prayer song of Mary. So she's singing this song that God has laid on her heart. And it's based on 1 Samuel, the words of Hannah that we find in 1 Samuel. And so Mary is like prophesying and quoting the Old Testament and at the same time announcing what's going on in her heart. It's a powerful spiritual moment. It's a great song. A song of the Christmas season. It's a song of faith which would be a prerequisite, prerequisite for carrying baby Jesus, right? Son of God. And so this is what we have, the song of Mary, that teaches us a lot. It teaches us so much about how we should worship the Lord and how we should engage and, and praise God and lift God up and honor God with our presence and with our worship to him. It's a great verse. Powerful passage of scripture. So I want us to break it down. Are you good with that? Can you break down with me today? And, and we'll break that down a little bit and learn some lessons that we, we get from Mary and her rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So Mary, number one, first point is this, is that Mary rejoices in her Lord and Savior always. It's a part of her life. It's a part of who she is. It should be a part of every believer. Scripture says in Luke 1, 46, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit, it rejoices, okay, in God, my Savior. I love this. This should be at the lips of every believer, uh, when God moves powerfully in the lives of his people and we become a believer, our first response to God's movement is always to rejoice in the Lord. Oh, God, thank you. We rejoice. It's a celebration, right? And when God works in our lives, it's always a celebration. And that's the first thing that comes to the lips of Mary when she hears this news about this baby that's inside of her and this work of God that's going on. When we belong to God, it just belongs in us. Rejoicing does. Celebrating for the Lord. Just it's what's inside of us. And when Jesus moves in us and we move towards the Lord and we rejoice in the Lord as our Savior and we lift him up and we begin to praise him. It happens in our song. It happens as we sing. It happens in our lives. We rejoice. We celebrate. We smile. 
You know, there's something about the love of God when it's inside of you, it always goes public. It always comes to your faith. It always, your face, it always shows up, okay? People can see it. Oh, there's something special. God must be there. God's presence always exposes itself inside of us and to the outside of us. We begin to see that, okay? Whenever I, if I, if I ever do something awkward, like if I trip or I do something kind of weird or I say something backwards, my first response from my wife is always to laugh at me, okay? I hate that. It makes me crazy. Why does she do that? You know, and she's like, <laughs> that's funny, right? And I'm like, why are you making fun of me? Actually, she's not. Actually, what she's doing is very biblical. She's just rejoicing with me a little bit, all right? Even in the bad time. Oh, yeah, it was a trip. It'll be all right, you know? You get up, we go on, we move on, you know? She's actually being very biblical. And when she does that and rejoices a little bit, then I end up kind of laughing too at myself. Oh, yeah, good. Thank you for the grace of God, you know, right? And I laugh at myself too. And we end up rejoicing together. That's just the way that life is. We rejoice in the things of life as they come. They're not always perfect, but they're always those things that we give credit to God for and say, Lord, we always rejoice in you. And that's Mary, the pregnant teenager that's not married and is rejoicing with what the Lord God is doing instead of her. I love Mary and I love her reaction. The book of Philippians tells us this. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoicing should be the spirit of God's people this time of the year. In fact, it should be the spirit of God's people any time of the year, no matter how well our team plays on Sunday, right? Or Saturday or Friday or whenever our team might play. And so God's people are rejoicing people. God's people should be looking for the opportunity to rejoice in every situation. God, where's the rejoicing here? I know you have something here, God, that you're active in, that you're doing, that you're moving. And so how can I rejoice in you? And so we should expect to rejoice as God's people. We should anticipate rejoicing as God's people. We should anticipate to say, praise the Lord. Thank God. We should anticipate that in our lives that we're going to get an opportunity to rejoice in the Lord. What a servant of God Mary is. She jumps at the opportunity to rejoice in the Lord. Isn't that amazing? I'm just impressed with that. And, and she's just always there. She has every reason, Mary does in her life, she had every reason to be negative, but instead she decides not to be negative. She decides to rejoice in the work and the activity of God as he's sending his Savior and working his redemption on this world. Isn't that cool? And so Mary celebrates. And so she teaches us that we should be rejoicing people that rejoice in the Lord, that trust in the Lord, that believe in the, the Lord, that we walk with the Lord and we rejoice. So Mary rejoices in her Lord and in her Savior, Jesus. Number two, Mary acknowledges God's work as all being done by grace. It's the grace of God. It's the mercy of God. And his work is graceful in our lives. Luke chapter 1, verse 48. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. She just acknowledges God's grace. God's grace has brought a blessing to me, she says. She's pouring his grace on me. And her first reflection on her situation is this has to be the work of God's grace. To God be the glory, she says. That's her first reflection. First thing she thinks of. This is the working of God. This is the grace of God. What a powerful thing. Mary realizes that God doesn't just trickle down his grace on us. He just pours it out on us. Isn't that cool? Just pours it out. Okay? See, we make a mistake sometimes. Sometimes we make a mistake. Oh, you know, I'm a pretty decent person. I'm okay. I just need a little bit of God's grace. If I could just get a little bit of God's grace, I would be okay. No, no, no. That's not how it works. Okay? Without God's grace, we have nothing. Without God's grace, we are empty. It's all about God's grace. And we don't need just a little trickle-down grace effect in our lives. If you try that, you're not going to have enough grace to make it. 
We need the pouring out of God's grace in our life. We need the blessing of God. We want a Lord and Savior that sends his son, his complete full son, Jesus, to go to the cross and die for us so that we can have the fullness of God's grace, not just enough grace to maybe make it by every once in a while, right? I mean, I need to pour it all over me. God, don't give me a little bit. You know, I need a lot, okay? When I take a shower, I just don't want a little bit of hot water. I like a whole lot of hot water, don't you? You know, a little bit of hot water runs out really quick on me and it gets really cold. Uh, I, I like it to be warm, you know, and so I want a whole lot. And so I just want the, the grace of God to be totally poured on our lives. And we want God to pour that grace out on us. We need it poured on us. It, it's, it's the only uh, you know, and the only way that we can receive that fullness of God's grace, if we receive the fullness of what Jesus has done for us, that's the only way we have a relationship with God. It comes through the fullness of Christ. And so we want the fullness of that grace to be poured out on our lives. And Mary, not only, she not only proclaims the grace of God over her life, but she also proclaims the grace of God from generation to generation to generation that even for the next generation, God has poured out enough grace for them. That's cool. I like that. Okay. Here's the question. Did things always go perfect for Mary? No, they didn't. She's a pregnant teenager. You get it? Not perfect for her. Well, but after Jesus was born, everything went perfect. No, it didn't always go perfect. Just because she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that life went perfect, okay? There was no room for them at the end. Are you kidding me? Lord, God, are you in control of this, God? You took a star and put it in the sky, and you took wise men across the world, and they came and fell. You can't provide an inn for these people to stay in, right? God, what's going on? Are you really in control here? How could it be? There's no room for Jesus at the end. Who's working this out, right? No, the Lord's in control. And she trusted him, and he provided in a way that it could never be provided any other way. He provides a manger, one of the lowest places that this Savior could come and be born to represent the fact that he came to die for the lowest of all mankind, and whosoever believes in him shall have the fullness of life. Wow. Oh. Well, I thought it went perfect. No, life doesn't go perfect. That's why we need the redemptive work of God in our lives. And we need his mercy. We need his grace. Life's not perfect, but neither are we, right? No, we're not perfect. And so we need what God brings us through his redemptive power in our lives so that our lives can have the fullness of what Jesus wants us to have. That's the redemptive work of Christ the redemptive work of God, that even in our sin, we can receive forgiveness by believing on the Savior that came and died for us. And so Mary acknowledges that this is the work of God's grace. It's all the grace of God that this is happening to me, she says. And she rejoices in that. Our building's flapping in the wind. So number three. <clears throat> Mary declares God's victory over the proud and the powerful. She declares victory for her people, for her humble people. I love Luke chapter 1, 51. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms, speaking about the Lord. He scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He lifts up those that trust him, those that are humble. He brings down thrones, but he lifts up those that believe in him and trust him. Mary rejoices because God declares victory over the proud and the powerful. And she rejoices in that. She rejoices in that for this world that we live in. This is a great declaration of the fullness of God. This is a deep theological declaration that Mary makes so powerful. The idea is that he, he scatters the proud and the powerful. And the idea is he has scattered the proud and the powerful. He does scatter the proud and the powerful, and he will scatter the proud and the powerful. He does it for generation after generation. He scatters those that are powerful 
<clears throat> and he lifts up those that are humble servants of God. It's just what God does. He's the true ruler. Those that rule on this world is temporary at most. Certainly not perfect in any way. How many of you know a perfect politician? Give me a break, right? Are you kidding me? Right? If we had the vote for a perfect politician, there would be no vote. They're all frail creatures of dust. And they prove it over and over and over again. They just do. Jesus and the Lord brings the powerful down. And he lifts up those that are his humble servants of the Lord. And so Mary declares the word of God. This word of God that's just beginning to be formed in her wound. That's just conceived. Just starting out. She proclaims this word of God as being powerful and fulfilling and it will complete the activity of the Lord as if it has already happened and it's just barely starting in her womb. How prophetic that is. She sees it as being full. Oh, it's already happened. It's as good as done. The Messiah has come. History has changed. Salvation is here. It's upon us. It's now. It's come. The Messiah has come. He is here. I love today we dedicated babies to the Lord. It's always fun watching the husbands and the wives, the mother and the dad, as they deal with the baby. They deal with it differently. You know, if I talk to the dad, the dad says, yeah, it's going to be cool. Seven months, I'm going to be a father. Can't wait. Is that what the mother says? <laughs> Are you kidding me? The mama says, I got a baby right now. The baby is here. It's with me. It's right here. I'm carrying it. I'm walking with it. Okay. See, dad thinks that dad doesn't even think it's coming. Yeah, he doesn't even, he's not smart enough to know. It's, it's, it's good as here. You better be saving your money right now. Right. All right. You know, we just don't see it the same. Not, 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 it's not right there. You're not holding it. It's not in you. Okay. But the mom, Mary says the presence of God is here. The Messiah has come. God's work is being fulfilled. Praise the Lord. I rejoice in my Lord and my Savior. I love that. So we should rejoice in Christ along beside the Mary. And the fathers do. You know, they get it. They go, oh yeah, you're right. It's, it's here right now. And they start rejoicing, enjoying that baby right then. It's right there. It's with us. It's crazy faith. Mary says the redemption of the world has come. As if it's already done, it's as good as done. Crazy faith that Mary has in the Lord. And so Mary just reiterates that God will tear down the thrones of this world. And he will lift up the humble, the lowly. He will lift up those that believe and those that follow him. He will lift them up to stand before the throne and to worship the Lord. He takes them off their thrones. And he puts God's people before the throne. In fact, the scripture says that as the people of Christ, of, of Jesus, the people are followers of Christ. It says that whenever you trust in the Lord, you become joint heirs with Christ to the kingdom of God. Joint heirs. You're receiving the benefits of the kingdom of God. Everything that the Lord has to offer, all that heaven has, all that eternal life has is being offered to you. You're joint heirs with Jesus. You stand beside him and you both have an heirship you receive together in the fullness of God. Isn't that cool? And so this Messiah comes and we believe and we trust and we follow and now we become servants in the kingdom of God. What a great, powerful thing. Mary uh, just, you know, declares this victory that we have uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. And so the, the Bible says that we are joint heirs with Jesus. So Mary declares the victory over the proud and the powerful. So she rejoices in her Lord. Uh, she, uh, number two, acknowledges this, this incredible movement of God's grace. And then she declares this victory over the proud and the powerful. What a, what a great song that Mary's singing here. And here's the last thing. You got time for one more? You're early. Um, Mary reflects on the wonders of God's work throughout all the generations. Verse 50. His mercy 
extends to those who fear him from generation to generation to generation. The, the, the wording is it just like keeps going. Mary's worship leads her to reflect of God's love and his movement in every generation that is to come. The cool thing about God's word is that it's generational. It's always generational. It gets handed down. It's passed down from generation to generation. But you know what? It's up to us to pass it down. If there's one thing I hope our, our families that committed today will learn and will grow to know is that it's up to them to pass it down. Don't let your children grow up in a spiritual vacuum. That's stupid. Don't do that. Can we use that language? I don't know. Don't do it. It's dumb. Influence. Influence with the word of God. Influence by rejoicing and living your life the way God would want you to do. Don't, don't leave that up to chance. God, that's not responsibility. The Lord wants us to pass it down from generation to generation to generation. That's just part of the blessing. I just love that. That we can always pass it down that God works as complete and full in the next generation as he does in gen this generation. Now, this year, uh, my mom passed away. And uh, my mom was an amazing person. I couldn't even explain how wonderful my mom was. My mom was the most, uh, how would you say? She, she was, everything had its place. She was organized. She was structured. She was clean, okay? And I inherited the desire to have that. I'm just not good at doing that, okay? But I like it done, all right? So I didn't get all that I needed there. And uh, so mom... At Christmas time, there's nothing in her house that didn't ever have its place for a certain reason. It was either historical, family, holiday. It had a reason for being there. There was, there was nothing accidental. My mom had a special book for everybody in our family that's ever been in the military. They would have a special place in the book. That's the way my mom was. She just handled things uh, that way. So at Christmas time, my mother had purchased every Christmas village made by mankind. I don't know what it was, okay? And so I inherited it, all right? And so Tisa, the elf, went to work in the last few weeks, and our house is just like one big Christmas village all over the house, okay? It was handed down from my mom. It's awesome, right? This is the, the, this is the cool thing about the kingdom of God. And guess what? My mom and my dad were so awesome that they just didn't hand down knickknacks and keepsakes, but they handed down their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to the next generation. And because of that, I and my three brothers, or my one brother, my two sisters, three of them, all committed to living out the things of Jesus. Why is that? It was generational. It was handed down to the next generation. God wants us to hand our faith down to the next generation from generation to generation. And mercy, the scripture said, extends to all of those who fear God from generation to generation. And God extends his mercy. My father was a salesman in the oil field forever. But a great man of God. Loved my dad. And dad taught me as a young man, to always extend my hand to other people. I was taught not to stand back, but to go forward and extend. Hey, welcome. Good to see you. Hey, hi. He taught me how to extend the hand all the time. I practiced that all the time. Except for I had a little heart transplant problem. And you know what they told me? You're not going to be able to shake hands anymore. I was like, what? I'm a pastor. Are you kidding me? I shake 300 hands a week. 
All right? You know? I said, this is not going to work. Okay. We'll let you shake hands one time a week, but be sure you sanitize every other handshake, right? Okay? And then what do you guys do? You walk in and shake my hand and you say, boy, I finally recovered from that flu I had last week. I'm like, what, why didn't you tell me that before we shook hands? No, you wouldn't do that on purpose. <laughs> Happens every once in a while. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> you know, that's the way it works. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful? Aren't you glad that God extends his mercy to us? You know, wait on us to do something. No, he extends it. He just steps out. That's the way God's people should be. We should be extending God's mercy to others. He just extends his grace. He extends his Mercy, and we're the benefactors. We just receive it. Thank you, God. Mary reflects the wonders of God from generation to generation as the, she knows that that mercy of God will be extended to all who will receive, to anyone that will come. It's yours. doesn't matter which generation. Man, she really worships God. What a song. It's poetry. It's singing. It's a prayer. It's more than that. It represents the way she lived her life. It's the, the way that all of God's people should live their lives. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. I don't know where God has you this Christmas. I don't know what God's trying to tell you or what's your next step spiritually. I know this. He always extends his grace to you in all of its fullness. All you have to do is take it. Maybe he's not your Lord and Savior and you need to make him that. Well, that's a good place to start. Maybe you're just not receiving all the fullness of what he has for you. Well, God wants you to walk through that. Maybe you're just going through a time where you need his mercy and his grace to be poured out on you just so you can get through it. And maybe you don't need a little bit, but you need a lot. Wherever you're at, God wants to meet that need. So whatever your prayer that you need to make to invite God to do that, why don't you make it right now? Just in the quietness of your own heart. Maybe you need to accept him as your personal savior. Or maybe you just need to follow deeper. Maybe you just need a touch of his mercy and his grace. Whatever it is, why don't you ask it? Make that your request this Christmas of God. Invite him in. And he promises to pour out on top of you all that he has. Why don't you do that right now? I'll give you a few seconds to make that commitment. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for this season. Bless us. As your people, give us your mercy. Give us your grace. Help us to live as Mary. Help us to rejoice in all the great things you've done for us. We give you the credit and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys.